Hi, my name is Nathan Johnson, and I am Executive Director of the Space Corp Foundation, a 501c3 educational nonprofit that promotes and supports space law and policy education and the rule of law. I am also an LLM Class of 2015 alum of the University of Nebraska College of Law, Space, Cyber, and Telecommunications Law Program, and I'm proud to have Nebraska as a partner at the Space Corp Foundation. We are happy to be invited to present this panel as part of Nebraska Space Law Week. Our topic is exploring space law education, leveraging archives and collections in research. Our panelists represent law libraries, international archives, and research programs. I want to start with our host organization and geographically work our way around the globe. So our first speaker will be Matt Novak, reference librarian at the University of Nebraska Law Library and professor of law. One, one minute to figure out the microphone button first and then uh, share my screen with you all. Great. Hopefully everybody is able to see my shared screen. Um, today I'm going to talk very briefly about the Schmidt Law Library Space Law Collection. Um, in 20, or 2008, the University of Nebraska College of Law developed a space and cyber um, and telecommunications LLM program. In response to that, the Nebraska College of Law Law Library had to be very quick and generate a space law collection to support that, uh, that endeavor. So we had to be very quickly go from not necessarily zero, but pretty close to zero collection all the way up to a program or collection that could support an LLM program. So to do that, we again, we need to very quickly curate a uh, collection that would serve the needs of that LLM program. And in doing that, we took, of course, the obvious step of consulting with the um, members of the new program, the faculty members, to make sure we understood the needs of that program. So that was obviously step one. Um, one of the major uh, decisions we made at that point in time is to recognize that we needed to, to be a practicing library and we also had minimal funds so we couldn't spend the time to curate a bunch of primary law resources. We recognized that as of 2008 and going forward many of the archival content was available online or in other collections so our ability to run out and get a hold of that kind of content was minimal. So we decided in consultation with the, um, the faculty that our primary focus would be to develop a very extensive, uh, deep collection of secondary resources to support scholars and academics within this space. To accomplish that, we went out onto the market and we were able to acquire what I've, I'm calling it the Mortimer Schwartz collection. Um, the, the collection consisted of approximately 700 titles actually close to 750 titles. Um, let me restate that, 750 volumes, approximately 450 different titles. And the genesis of that collection was a gentleman named Mortimer Schwartz. Any of you um, space law historians might recognize his name. He was an early pioneer in the ILSA program. He was an early founder of that, helped found that program. And so as a librarian at Oklahoma, he started collecting and creating a collection in the 1950s. Very deep collection, very wide collection. His goal was to collect a comprehensive collection of space law secondary resources. So that was the genesis of that program, that collection. He subsequently retired and the collection was sold to um, Mercer School of Law sometime later. Mercer had the collection for a number of years, continued to curate and collect it, but then they also decided to get out of the space law game, which was very fortunate for us as they were getting out of that collection. We were looking for a collection and a collection that we could get up and running very quickly. So we went out and acquired this collection. And as I said, that um, allowed us to acquire over 450 space law titles very quickly. And unfortunately that was not everything we needed. It had a great deal of historical content and, and some of the uh, secondary resources that were very relevant, but in consultation with the law faculty, we knew we had to continue to make some very serious uh, um, purchases within that marketplace, and we made a lot, a lot of additional purchases as well. 
in addition, um, the space law collection within our library is very much a growing collection. We devote a fair amount of our budget uh, towards continuing to collect in this uh, space. So our collection of secondary resources continues to uh, um, expand. And just for this presentation, I went out and compared our collection just to some of the major law libraries out there in the world. And our space law collection is probably, if not, if not as large, larger than some of the major um, law libraries in the country. Beyond that, those two areas, we have some other very important resources that I'll very briefly talk on. I think uh, they might be picked up on by some of the other speakers on the panel as well, so I won't want to monopolize those content too much. Um, one very, very important resource that we rely on extensively for many resources is Hein Online Database. And again, I think one of our other presenters might discuss about that uh, as well, but that database is very important to our program with lots of content in there that we rely on, uh, ILSA content, uh, et cetera. One of the um, resources that I really like in the Heine Line database is the index to foreign legal periodicals, which really opens up the scholarship to us that so we're no longer just uh, having to focus on domestic US scholarship, we really get access to a, a much more global uh, flavor of uh, research out there. Um, in addition to the just the very specific space law content, we've also made an effort to collect in the international law secondary resources area. And that's a very important to our collection as well. As you all should know, uh, space law is part of an international law uh, field. Uh, as such, our scholars need to have a well-grounded uh, understanding of that area. Um, one of the very useful resources that we spend a lot of time with is the Max Planck Encyclopedia of Public International Law. Highly useful resource. All right, I'll take one more minute and then uh, move along to let my other colleagues speak here. Um, so real quickly, how do we leverage that collection? How can scholars leverage this collection? How can students leverage our collection? Well, as a part of the program, as part of the LLM program, our, LLL, our LLMs and JDs take a researching space law class that I teach, which is, that's the goal of that class is to help them leverage our collection. So that's one way our local population leverages the collection. Beyond that, uh, and again, I don't, I'll let possibly one of my other colleagues speak to this a little bit more, but uh, consulting great research guides. Librarians especially love to create research guides to help people leverage collections. That's what they are there for. Uh, so there's tons of great research guides out there. Um, here's an example of one on the screen that I created. Nothing special about it. Lots of other research guides out there, but this is just one, one example of a research guide that has compiled lots of different secondary resources just to try to get you, like I said, as the program says, to help you leverage a collection. So, and if you see that there's a URL there across the top of the screen, you can jump into this uh, research guide. And I think that would, um, again, help you leverage our collection. So I think I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it along here. Thank you very much, Matt. And I also want to uh, put out there full disclosure, Matt was my professor of international research during my year at the University of Nebraska. So thank you again, Matt. Um, now we'll move our way from the heartland down south to our next speaker, Chris Gilliland, director of the University of Mississippi Law Library and professor of law. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you to talk about the resources that we have, too. Um, and I want to say thank you to the University of Nebraska and the Space Court Foundation for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed that, Matt. Thank you, because we're kind of the opposite in some ways. Um, the University of Mississippi, you may be a little surprised, I was when I arrived, has long been the major player in space law education and scholarship. Um, and our collection is also very big. We, we collect everything we possibly can almost, um, and, but it's been organically grown. Um, we've had a strong space law presence since the early 1960s, um, and that started with Dr. Stephen Grove. And I'll talk a little bit more about Professor Grove in just a minute, but I thought it might be helpful just to tell you a little bit about our institutional setup. 
Um, the University of Mississippi is in Oxford, Mississippi, which is in the northern part of the state. Um, we're about an hour southeast of Memphis, Tennessee, um, so um, way up at the top of the state. Um, and about three hours drive east of us is Huntsville, Alabama, um, I think world renowned for Space Camp and also the Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and at the Mississippi Gulf Coast, about a half day's drive south of us, is the Stennis Space Center. Um, and I just want to give them a little bit of a shout out right now because they have been NASA's rocket testing site for over 50 years. They did Saturn, they did Apollo, and right now, right now, this month, next month, they're finishing up the tests for the new launch system that will power the Artemis mission to the moon. So returning Americans to the moon, this, I think that someone correct me, but the lunar south pole, I believe, by 2024. Um, and they're doing the last test of the rocket system the first week in November, a hot fire test. So that gives you a little bit of an idea that you might not think the University of Mississippi um, would be such a leader in the world, but we are, and we're in the midst of a um, sort of an infrastructure there. Um, Dr. Grove, um, a graduate of the University of Budapest in 1939, a lawyer, um, he came to the States in the 40s um, and was educated at Yale, at Yale Law School. He, he got advanced law degrees there. He worked with a Mississippian, longtime Yale Law professor named Myers McDougall, who was an early space law scholar. Um, and um, in 1965, Dr. Grove arrived at the University of Mississippi and began to build this program. He developed and taught the first space law course that was regularly taught. And he founded the, the Journal of Space Law in 1973, which has really been the premier outlet for space law scholarship in this country, the Journal of Space Law. Um, Want to give them a shout out too. They've just published a new issue. It's on the Center for Air and Space Law's website. You can find more information about it. Um, its past issues are in the database that Professor Novak was talking about, Hein Online. Um, so, the space law cu curriculum began, um, the Journal of Space Law began. In 2000, the University of Mississippi landed a NASA-funded research center called, bear with me, it's a long title, the National Remote Sensing Aviation and Space Law Center. Um, it's now called the Center for Air and Space Law. And Dr. Groh was the first director. one of her top priorities, building the archives. We'd always had this strong collection, but we did not have much in the way of the papers of the founding fathers and mothers, if you will, of space law. Um, and so she set out to do this. It was very important because we do have a master's of law program in space law and uh, wanted to support that. We also now, by the way, have a certificate in space law for non-lawyers who are interested in advancing their knowledge. Um, and that program today, both the Journal of Space Law um, and the LM program are um, um, ably led by my colleagues, Charles Stotler and Michelle Hanlon. Um, so Joanne Gabrinowitz, Professor Gabrinowitz, she set out to build the archives and in a very short time was very successful. We have a small collection um, of um, um, archive materials, but it's very, very rich. And it centers on three individuals. And those people are Professor Garove, not surprisingly, but also Andrew G. Haley and Eileen Galloway. Haley and Galloway. And I do not think I'm overstating when I say they are towering figures in the world of space law. Um, they really almost, I guess you could say, create space law in, the, in a certain way. Um, tireless, dedicated, very bright. It goes on and on. They are brilliant individuals. Um, Andrew Haley um, is widely considered to be the first person in the world who practiced space law. Um, he started off like uh, Mrs. Galloway did in, in D.C. in the federal government. Um, he was one of the people who helped draft the Communications Act of 1934, and he maintained an interest in astronautical communications the rest of his life. Turns out he was also brilliant at, and an expert at, 
jet propulsion, rocket propulsion. So in 1942, he co-founded Aerojet. Um, and some of you may have heard of Aerojet. It is today, its incarnation today is Aerojet rocket dying. And in just a very few short years, um, he took it to billions of dollars in revenue, 30,000 plus employees. Um, he was a very important figure. Um, he's the founder of the Institute of um, the International Institute of Space Law. Uh, he worked in any any piece of space law you could touch. He did. Um, he died in 1966. Um, but we have his papers. Um, Professor Garove had worked for him. Mrs. Galloway, on the other hand, um, sometimes called the grand dame of uh, space law, spent her career, her legal career, in Washington. Um, in 1957, when Sputnik, Sputnik was launched by the Russians, um, she was working at the Congressional Research Service and had just published a paper on guided missile systems. Then Senator Lyndon Johnson had seen it, and he called her in and said, come help the committee. He was the chair of the Senate Armed Forces Committee at the time. We're going to be investigating American preparedness in space. And from that point on, she really was the congressional staff person who was the point person for all these things. Um, with Senator Johnson and John McCormick, who was the majority leader in the House of Representatives at the time, the three of them wrote the National Aeronautics and Space Act. Um, really, her influence is all over it. Um, emphasis on international cooperation, on peaceful uses of outer space, and she writes the provision that establishes NASA. And for lawyers, she does this um, very important but subtle thing. NASA was originally gonna be called the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. And she said, let's make it an administration. That enabled that organization to reach across all federal agencies to coordinate activities. Um, she also became very involved at the international level. Um, she was one of the people who helped create the United, United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses in Outer Space and was one of the drafters of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Um, so, uh, again, these people were tireless in their work to develop these basic frameworks for both domestic space law and international space law um, that we still use today. Uh, they were also incredibly prolific scholars. They wrote many, many books, many, many articles, wrote many, many letters. And these things are all in their archives that we have today. Um, the Haley and the Galloway collections are completely processed and available to scholars. Um, we have really good finding aids for them as well. Um, all you really need to do to find them is go to the Center for Air and Space Law. You'll see it find bios of all these people and also a link to these finding aids that tell you, you know, what's in the collection at a, at a pretty detailed level. And we certainly can help you there. Um, you can also just Google their name, Andrew G. Haley Finding Aid or Eileen Galloway, E-I-L-E-N-E, -E -E, Galloway Finding Aid, and it will link you right there. Uh, Mrs. Galloway died in 2009 at the age of 103, and I will just tell you she had published an article two months before and had one published posthumously. So there's lots and lots of rich materials in the, in the collection. I think I'm at, about out of time here, so I'll just wrap that up and say that um, I'm glad to talk more about how um, you can leverage this co collection for your own scholarship um, and the kind of support we give. Um, you can always email us at lawref at olmiss.edu. That's L-A-W-R-E-F at olmiss.edu. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Hedman. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, now we'll go across the Atlantic and head over to Vienna for our next speaker, Nicholas Hedman, Chief of Committee Policy and Legal Affairs Section of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Nicholas. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, indeed. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be in, in this group and address you. Um, so I represent the Office for Outer Space Affairs of the United Nations System. And uh, this is the department of the UN system that has served the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space since 1958. Um, in the beginning, the first years, uh, UNUSA was only a, a, a section within a, a much larger structure and resided in New York, in the headquarters in, in New York. 
um, because the Committee on the Peaceful Uses at that time met uh, at the UNHQ. Uh, over the years, uh, the, uh, the office has grown and in the, the uh, early 90s, it was uh, relocated to Vienna. So we have not been in Vienna that long. And the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and its two subcommittees, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee and Legal Subcommittee, they meet annually here at Vienna. Um, so when it comes to, to documentation, archiving, sources, and all the collection of primary documents, uh, it is, of course, uh, quite painful, if I may say so, to go over from uh, written paper documentation to uh, digital uh, sources. Uh, it, it takes a lot of efforts, a lot of time to transform documentation into a digitized environment and to do it properly. That is really not easy. Uh, so I would like to just to share with you, since you are students um, pursuing a law student career and, and probably you, uh, you are at different levels, but regardless of the level you are in your studies, you need really to go into the, the sources of, uh, of, of space law. Not only space law, but also on the political side of international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space as has really been the, the, uh, the, the pillar of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space for 60 years. And as you might already know now, uh, this is the committee vested with the treaty making power. So the five treaties um, from the Outer Space Treaty to the Moon Agreement, the, uh, the sets of principles, resolutions, guidelines with the latest one, the long-term sustainability guidelines adopted last year in 2019 by Coopers, have been created by this body. And obviously, when it comes to treaty making, it is the legal subcommittee where the negotiations were held. But formally, it is the committee, the main committee that then rubber stamp and adopt the instruments and eventually the General Assembly, which is the parent body of Coopers, is the ultimate decision-making uh, power. This is interesting to note the relationship between Coopers and the General Assembly because the General Assembly created Coopers in 1958 as an ad hoc committee. And only one year later in 1959, it uh, received its permanent status. So the General Assembly is the parent organization, the parent body, decision-making body for Coopers. So every year, since the beginning, uh, we pass a resolution uh, on international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space through the, uh, the, the committee systems under the General Assembly. And that is important to, to, uh, to really note because uh, then it means that documentation, archiving, the whole collection of, uh, I would say, institutional memory and history of this intergovernmental body is not only with you and USA uh, in Vienna in our role in servicing the body, but it's really a heritage of the United Nations system. The prime source of documentation, uh, all documents from the beginning, uh, is actually with the UNHQ in New York. The Dog Hammarskjöld Library is the primary library with a collection of uh, paper documents and also digitized sources. But really there you can find uh, documents that you won't be able to find on the internet or through any search engines. The ODS, which stands for the official UN documentation system, is the tool that delegations use, we as the Secretariat, but also delegates of member states use in, in, in getting documentation. Uh, all documents being generated throughout the entire UN system uh, since 1995 uh, are in that system. It's a very difficult system. The, the search engine is, is very complex and it's not, the, the whole system is not open to external uh, stakeholders. So it's really for governments and for the UN system. So it, it's really difficult to use the ODS. But if you get to the ODS, the official UN documentation system, and you have the symbol number, you know the symbol number of a particular document, you might be able to find it if I put it that way. Not encouraging, but I had to say it now. Uh, 
other libraries, I mean, you are here in this panel, it's, it's mainly uh, university libraries, but I would also say, since I worked before I came to the EU when I worked with the Swedish government with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and all official documents from Coopus, because I was, I was uh, handling Coopus for 10 years as a delegate to Sweden. So I received all documents from Vienna, from the documentation management system. And I had to archive that in the, the central archive of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So in the United States, I imagine it's the State Department that really has, should have a wide collection of documents uh, from, uh, from uh, the formal negotiations of the treaties and also from sessions of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So now over to uh, something uh, really how you can, you can get documents today. Uh, I would say the website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, www.unosa with double O, Org. So www.unoosa.org, that's our main website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs. And uh, since uh, 2010, we are uh, uploading all session documents, both pre-session pre and in-session documentation for the committee and its two subcommittees. So it's not that long ago. I mean, it's only 10, the last 10 years, but nevertheless, the past 10 years, if you go to those web pages, there you will be able to, um, to download and, and access all documents, uh, not only the formal documents in all official UN languages, the six languages of the UN, but also conference room papers and non-papers and presentations being delivered by delegates uh, of member states and also permanent observer organizations to, to the intergovernmental body. You will find them there. So it's actually something we're building up. So that, that is for 10 years we have been doing that and we will continue. Now, at the Office for Outer Space Affairs, where we reside in Vienna, we, we have an old archive in, in our premises. It's not part of the, the United Nations Vienna UN headquarters library. It's part of the Office for Outer Space Affairs, where we have those old cabinets with thousands of documents, because we, we had to collect all the documents in all languages from the beginning, 1958. So there we have all the documents and they are fragile, they are deteriorating. Um, it's really a, a, a primary source, I would say. It's so precious, but it's difficult to find the documentation that you really are, are looking for. And it's not open for the public, but it exists there. And you can always ask the Office for Outer Space Affairs, and we can see if you can help you to retrieve a document you're looking for. Years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, we started an endeavor with the interns that uh, came to the Office for Outer Space Affairs, in particular in my section, uh, to uh, create what we label the travaux préparatoires of the treaties or preparatory works of the five treaties. So we have on our website uh, scanned <laughs> documents from uh, the history of the treaty making. So you will find documents there in PDF form. Now, obviously, those poor interns, they had to scan with a manual desk scanner. So you can imagine the, the, the difficulty to read the documents, obviously. But, and also not all documents are identified. That set aside, the, the preparatory works as we have, we have put them on the website contains a list of documents. So at least you get the symbol numbers and uh, in each individual proposal by states, individual states or group of states, and you can see the flow of the negotiations leading to the Outer Space Treaty and the other four treaties. So that is also quite a valuable source that you can use and then you can try to find the document if you don't find it on our website. We have uh, managed to upload all the General Assembly resolutions on international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space on our website. From the first resolution in 1958 up till now. So all resolutions are there in fairly good quality. All the reports of Coopus from the first report up till now are also available on the website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs. We are now in the next phase, we are looking together with the documentation services, uh, the conference management services of UNOV here in Vienna, 
to professionally uh, digitize uh, the, uh, the reports of our subcommittee, so the scientific and technical subcommittee and legal subcommittee. Uh, but I can tell you again, it, it takes a lot of efforts. It's manpower. Uh, we don't have a budget to do that. CMS, they are trying to help us with it. And this is something that will take time, but we will not rest until we have, I would say, the primary reports uh, on our website, uh, hopefully in all languages, and then just to continue, continue up till we have all documentation of Coopus uploaded and digitized. Uh, I'm looking at the next 20 years, obviously now, but uh, we are trying our best to, uh, to really provide a source so that students uh, as part of academia, but also our member states and, and organizations and the, the space community at large, at least can get what they need operationally from the website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas. And the Space Corps Foundation uh, is very aware of the intern program you have there at UN USA. We have uh, a director, an officer, and uh, an advisor who have all gone through the internship program, yep. Daniel Porras, Charles Stotler, and Amanda Berman. Uh, wow. So, so thank you. I know them all. I know them all. <laughs> I know Amanda is, is, uh, is, is in here. And so I... <laughs> And you also know our next speaker, uh, who I'll introduce to sort of tie all of these places together. He's my colleague at the Space Corp Foundation and chairman of the board of directors, Chris Hearsey. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to be here on this panel. Uh, you know, I, I actually am an old Miss alum. I went through uh, the GD program uh, and the certificate in air and space law. I was actually uh, the president of the Grove Society. Um, uh, I worked in the archive and uh, was part of Manfred Locks. And, you know, these experiences really, oddly enough, uh, came because I decided my senior year in college to try being a law librarian. And uh, I ended up working at University of Pennsylvania Law School. I was a Knight reference law librarian, and I ended up working uh, at Temple University where I was uh, going to school. And... What, what was amazing to me is at the time I, I had transitioned from basically trying to be a scientist, I wanted to be an astrophysicist, and I ended up moving more into mathematical economics and policy. And uh, at the time, the director of the law school, uh, Ed Greenlee, uh, encouraged me to uh, look at a career in you know, doing policy or something in DC. And uh, uh, I was pretty much sold on that. And then I discovered that uh, Penn Law had an entire archive of space law materials. And in fact, um, uh, one of the early books I remember reading was Heaven, uh, Heavens and the Earth by, uh, by McDougall. And uh, turned out, turns out that uh, McDougall did some research at Penn for the book. And for those who don't know it, it is basically the seminal history of, of uh, the early uh, space flight days. Um, how we got in the United States in the 1940s to a rocket program uh, to Sputnik and uh, what that uh, uh, gave us in terms of space activities and what that enabled. And, you know, while our name is the Space Court Foundation, as we all know, there is no court in space. There is no court that has the jurisdiction wholly to cover disputes in space, but it's meant as sort of a metaphor on what we're, we're trying to project here. And one of it is that we are set up to do space law and policy uh, research and education. But most importantly, we're also, we also want to take the, the time to understand that the rule of law is also important. And all of the, these things fit together in, in, in a way that uh, tells a different story about space law. And having you know, all the distinguished panelists here today, they're, they're part of that story. Um, my next position out of uh, undergrad, I got into the program uh, at American University master's program in legal theory, and I worked uh, with Howard McCurdy, who has done a lot of policy and economics on the space side. And in fact, uh, I'm sure all your archives probably have a lot of his stuff. I think one of his, his, his um, uh, early works was better, better, Faster, Cheaper, and looking at the public administration of space technologies. But oddly enough, I, I ended up getting an early opportunity working for David Dvorkin at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. 
And in fact, my early exposure to space was space history. And my research topic at the time, I wrote a, a hundred page report basically uh, about all the things that went on and around um, the creation of uh, NASA, how it went from NACA to NASA, all the folks that were involved, uh, how it connected with policy making uh, at the highest levels with President Eisenhower and the Killian Committee. Um, so those who don't know space history, uh, either American, Russian, European, Japanese, whatever, I highly encourage you to start there because it's telling you a story about what's going on. And these documents reflect those stories, whether it's about the type of space activities that might or might not be permissible, the, the folks involved in the policy and the legal and the lawmaking, you know, all of this has happened, continues to happen and will happen. And the Space Corps Foundation is trying to focus that story through our initiatives. And um, one of the main goals is for us to engage institutions in civil society when it comes to space issues, space law issues, space policy issues, space activities. And we sort of designed um, four, three programs, really four programs, um, depending on I wanna cut this here, but I wanna go through them briefly with you because I think it sort of informs um, you know, the utility of uh, this panel. We couldn't do what we wanna do without institutions like Old Miss, like UN Copus, like uh, Nebraska or McGill or any of the foundations or institutions that, that maintain these records. They tell the story of space. And uh, it's interesting, and I will say as a side note, you know, I had uh, studied under John Gabrinowitz at Old Miss and you know, had gone through the Galloway stuff. I, I, had, I had attended, I think, every Galloway between the 3rd and the 15th, uh, or actually 15th is coming to 14th. And what's really funny is to compare that experience working on the archive and to look at actually the space history, Galloway tends to be a footnote. Uh, if she's mentioned, she's sort of mentioned as, um, uh, is an advisor to Senator Johnson before he was president. And, and that doesn't tell the right story. She was very, very instrumental in everything that was going on. And there were actually other, other folks as well, Fred Whipple and, and, and a few others. But, but Eileen Galloway really, really did a tremendous amount of, of legwork and, and, and put in so many hours um, to grow and develop our new US national space law and influenced all the other ones that have come before. And uh, the archive is, and I just wanna just plug again the Old Miss archive, it's got a lot of great material in it. I, I can't even go, th mentions half of it, but um, there's some, I think there's some very interesting stories there. So if you're looking to do space law scholarship and history, I highly encourage you to go to all these archives. So let's, let's briefly talk about, you know, what Space Court is, is putting together in terms of programming. The first and foremost is Nathan and I have spent about two years putting together a show called Stellar Decisis. And part of the idea here is it is take moot court, take animation, and take problems we know exist in space law are likely to exist, things that have been explored in all of these materials. And we want to be able to, to communicate space law in a very unique way. Um, and so this is something that we're working on and hopefully we'll have the pilot ready in, in a couple of months. But we want to showcase not only the community, but how and what types of problems are going to occur in space. What are those disputes? And so that's where the name Space Court again comes back. The idea being is at some point we're going to have people living and, and working in space on the moon, maybe on Mars, maybe on, on other places, maybe on space stations. And every time we send people, all of our laws, all of our history, our entire story is going into space. Now, inevitably, humans will fail, and things will fail, and disputes will arise. And we want to explore that through this series. And we really uh, uh, are looking forward to being able to, to finally get that out for you. Um, but along with that is our, our video series as well. We've just finally started up. Um, I think we've done three or four programs so far. And the last two, I think some of you may have, have watched, and if you haven't, I highly encourage you. The, the first or the third one we did was on the Artemis Accords. And we had Mike Gold, who's the acting associate administrator uh, at NASA, and Gabriel Swinney um, from the U.S. State Department, two people instrumental on negotiating the Artemis Accords, along with 
uh, Guia Wong, who is a Chinese uh, space law expert. Um, uh, uh, who else do we have? Uh, Una Sands, who's an arbitration attorney. And who am I forgetting, Nathan? I'm forgetting one other person. <laughs> I know I am. I feel bad. Uh, but uh, that was an historic moment because both uh, uh, Gabriel and Mike were talking in the capacity as, as government officials. And um, we want to engage in this level of dialogue and, and bring together um, different points of view. And the last video we did was for our interns. It was an orientation or intern orientation where we had several, we had two panels, uh, one government panel, one uh, commercial panel, and two keynote speakers who gave a broad array of perspectives on what students and young professionals should be thinking about in their careers, uh, if they want to get into space law, what, uh, uh, where they might find jobs, uh, and, and some of the common themes that, that all of us uh, um, uh, have discovered in our own careers and our own experiences in our own, you know, in the positions that we have today in space law and in the space law community. But really our, our research flagship is the Space Court Law Library, and there's two projects that we have under that. The first one is our internship program. And we are really excited to start this year. We have uh, students of a tremendous diverse background. Right now, I believe, when we look at the numbers as of today, I think we have over 10 interns who have been processed and are about to begin work. Uh, and we have 10 in the pipeline and we have lots more coming. Uh, it's a rolling admission and uh, you know, just reach out, go to our website at spacecourtfoundation.org and the application is there. And it's run by our uh, officer, Julia Millette. And uh, uh, we really look forward to, to speaking you, with you more if you're interested in interning with us. So if you're gonna intern with us, what, what are you gonna do? Oh, I actually should mention, you know, we do have several Nebraska law students and you know, we're really grateful for that. And we wanna provide all law students, no matter the institution, um, a, a place to, to do different types of research, to do something innovative. So let's get into that real quick and, and kind of what we're doing with the Space Court Law Library. Uh, we have created what's called the International Yearbook of Space Activities. And the idea is to follow in some way the same format, if you're familiar with uh, the British or the Polish International Yearbooks. We wanna be able to collect by year and work our way back. And so for every year we put together a compendium of, of laws that came into force, whether they're national laws or international laws. Uh, we are also instituting committees that will develop methodologies and a space law dictionary that we will host online. Uh, all of this is meant for us to review the three sources of law, the custom, international agreements, and general principles of law, and compare the different sources and find patterns in the law, find clarity in the law where there is, and try to identify more clearly where there might be more gaps. And um, along with that, we, uh, uh, we want to create an audiovisual series that also uh, would include things like a 10 or 20 minute video on uh, very seminal cases in public international law or national law, uh, ICJ cases, PCIJ cases like Lotus and Corfu, uh, Gabjakovo, things like that. Things that are, that are relevant to um, our understanding of space law. And, uh, the whole goal, again, at the end of the day is to map the primary sources of law because our main interest and our main research question, are what are the rules that govern space activities? Uh, how do states regulate the conduct of space activities, whether it's governmental or non-governmental? Uh, so we have a lot of different uh, um, opportunities for people to do research. And the two outcomes that we have for every intern um, is to uh, put together a publishable work we wanna be able to either uh, give them a fora within the International Yearbook of Space Activities to write an in-depth, actually well-researched article that would be publishable at any leading uh, journal, uh, including the Journal of Space Law and others. Um, uh, or we wanna be able to have them contribute directly to the International Yearbook of Space Activities and work with the editorial board. Um, the other is to assist us on, on doing the background research on these videos. Uh, you know, there's a lot of the material uh, about some of the, these international legal cases, you know, between the PCIJ and the ICJ, I think there are less than 250, and not all of them are terribly relevant to space activities. So we think this is a very doable um, um, uh, process, 
And I think the whole point is, is to provide additional content rather than just the resusc resuscitation of the case. You know, what was going on? What's the context? We want to understand, you know, there are different ways of interpreting rules. And that's part of our methodological approach. And there's different ways of interpreting uh, legal sources. And each way, depending upon which one you choose, can lead to different results. And so I think it's very important just as a, as a matter of jurisprudential, Jewish <laughs> jurisprudential exercise um, that we, we understand as a community you know, where the law would be going given, given our current temperament in, in the law. Uh, so that's, that's sort of a brief rundown of what we're doing with the Space Court Law Library. And, and again, I wanna say uh, thank you to Nebraska and the University of Leiden for being uh, partners. And we look forward to having many other institutions uh, and universities as partners. And to find out more about Space Court, um, please subscribe and like to our YouTube channel. That's where you'll find all our video series. Uh, uh, videos and we'll have more upcoming in the, in the next few weeks. So please look out for that. We're also on Twitter and Facebook and, and others. So really encourage you to, uh, to get involved. Um, and uh, oh, I should mention, sorry, one last thing uh, about the law library is we're trying to aggregate this data. So one of the things that we want to do is work with all of the different law libraries so that you know what's out there. And um, uh, there's lots of institutions, as Matt noted, that may not uh, know what they have, and there's lots of people that may know, not know where to look. And so reference law, law librarians are essential to that, and I, and I highly, highly encourage you all to use yours if you have access to them, uh, because they're great resources, great people, and uh, really looking forward to uh, the rest of this panel. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I want to briefly take a moment to uh, remind our attendees that there is a Q&A function. Uh, that you can submit questions for our panelists. We already have a couple of questions there uh, and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but first I wanna circle back around uh, to what both Chris's, Chris G and Chris Hearsey have mentioned, Eileen Galloway and um, you know, the University of Mississippi helped start the annual Eileen Galloway Symposia in Critical Issues in Space Law that's held annually for the past 14 years in Washington, DC. Uh, the University of Nebraska has recently been a supporting sponsor of the Galloway Symposia. Uh, and so I think that is one of the efforts in which uh, the space law community has tried to uh, maintain and raise the profile of Eileen Galloway's influence on the development of space law in the United States. Um, so I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to throw out a couple of questions to our panelists. Um, and get us involved in a discussion. So my first question for all of you, um, what is the value of an archive and collection in the digital age? Um, and you know, I think this issue is maybe even more exacerbated by the pandemic and protocols to you know, avoid uh, being in enclosed spaces uh, and being touching the same things as everybody else. So um, I'll, start, I'll start with Matt. What is the value right now in the digital age of these archives? Well, that's, uh, thanks for starting with me actually, because at, like I said, at Schmidt, or at Schmidt Law Library, we don't really have an archive of these, you know, these historic documents. Um, I rely on these other folks to have their strong archives. Um, and frankly, that's what a lot, most of the uh, researchers out there doing space law research are going to have to do is they're going to have to rely on some of these other organizations, UNO says, archives. So that's, you know, critical um, in my class that I cover. I uh, teach the UNO so website extensively. We probably know every, every period on that page. I <laughs> so it's, it's uh, from that perspective, it's very, very um, uh, vital. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of maybe lead into the other folks. Um, you know, the expense, um, some have already alluded to it, the expense of turning some of these archives into digital content is astronomical in some cases, and uh, probably in the near future still not feasible. So I'll kind of let somebody else segue into it from there. I could yeah, uh, j just to add what, what Matt says here, and uh, it, it, it depends on what documentation, what sources you're looking for. Um, I mean, if you take the, the primary sources of the United Nations, uh, on the, in particular for the uh, negotiations on, on the, the treaties, 
the space space treaties. Um, those documents are not copyrighted, so I mean it's a public domain. UN UN formal UN documents in all languages are are open open source, so we don't have to bother with all that. Now the digitalization is here to stay, as we know. So archiving archiving paper documents is for research purposes and and. Along the lines, when we manage to digitize documents straight into the uh, the, uh, the 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 computer age, um, those paper documents will simply disappear. You know, I mean that is inevitable. But I want to offer to you something, an experience I, I've had since I also worked uh, in, in a government in the, in the Swedish government, a minister of foreign affairs. And I recall when I when I started there. Um, we didn't have email. I mean, we had, this was like in the dawn of, of, of uh, the computer age in the, in the early 90s. And um, uh, so when email came, I mean, we actually had to archive every document we were writing. So, so memos and everything had to be archived. And then when email came, it was so convenient just to, to send off an email. And while responding to a question or making an analysis in an email, it's actually really a, a, a piece of research you're doing there. And then you don't archive it. So it was really a concern that there is a lot of institutional memory and a lot of, of value in operational work of the ministry that got lost because people were sending emails and they were not archiving. it. And I see that also now in my work, I'm doing a lot of research when I'm, I'm uh, in particular when I'm uh, uh, dealing with uh, New York, the Office of Legal Affairs, for instance, on quite complex legal matters. And that's all through email. So I try to archive, I mean, to print out and then put in our archive. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also a matter of when, if you do that in, in all your email communication, no, you don't. So there is a lot of information that is getting lost, a lot of information out there that is not any longer uh, being uh, archived for the future. And that's a pity. And I, I think we should be mindful of that. Well, Nicholas, based on, on, on that question, um, let me go on and ask, how can we be making better use of our archives and collections? And uh, I'll let Chris uh, H um, have some input on this. Well, I, so one of the things that we're certainly trying to do is make sure that all the best resources of public international law are paired with what we know out there for space law. And there are a lot of great archives. You can go to the, I think Peace Palace has a search engine. Certainly the ICJ does. You can look at every case, every, um, every part of the case. Uh, I think going back to its founding, um, uh, uh, there are a lot of other uh, universities who really focus on public international law, but you know a lot of the resources, resources are usually for very specific areas of, of public international law, maybe even private international law. So, you know, what, I think the best way, again, for for students is to start with all of the universities that have space law programs, right? And um, uh, certainly, our goal with uh, both the uh, research guide and doing a survey of archives, you know, we can have a better sense of, of mapping what's, what's out there. Uh, and certainly with the assistance of, of everyone on this panel and, and, and other reference law librarians, um, you know, I don't think this is an necessarily an insurmountable thing. Um, and uh, uh, I think, you know, certainly there, there are a lot of things that we could do uh, internally under an internship uh, and I'm sure there's lots of things that one could do uh, with Nicholas, because others have done it. Um, and, and the efforts of all of the other collections, you know, I think really um, uh, give students a lot of powerful resources beyond just what they maybe see like the colloquia, right? That's a very narrow view of, um, you know, what space law is generating. Or, uh, you know, look at all the, the, you have the journal space law, you have the annals at McGill, you have the clone commentaries, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of different resources, but in terms of like, really like a space law dictionary, my, my understanding is one of the, the only few attempts was Secure World Foundation and uh, GW uh, Space Policy Institute uh, did a dictionary about 10 years ago. And, you know, we want to pick up that mantle because I think it's important um, 
especially when you're trying to understand what a space activity is and what's a permissible space activity or to the extent that the treaty might apply to certain types of space activities. You know, the, there's, there's other treaties out there as well that we have to look and borrow from from other areas of public international law. But I think the, the other important point about doing the research and, and what we're trying to do is to look at it hierarchical. And um, one of our intentions with our website is so you could go to a, a textual version of the Outer Space Treaty, go to a legal term like jurisdiction and control or authorization and continuing supervision, and that would link you to a list of all the national space laws. Now, um, I've actually, I know it's doable because I actually did this exercise for uh, my graduate thesis at the University of North Dakota Space Studies Program and had to rely almost 95% on the UN uh, USA website. Uh, and there's no way, so thank you, Nicholas, for providing those resources because there's no way I would have done, done that because the whole project was confirming uh, every country who had ever signed any of the treaties when they put their national laws together and look at how um, space law was created and evolved over time, uh, just looking at how rules are used. But the, the, the exercise for us at the end of the day is going to be um, the comparative analysis, which, which I, I don't know that many people um, in different ways, in different forms, in, 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 in some secondary sources, they've done bits and pieces of this. But as you know, all activities that occur in space you know, could also occur here on Earth and so there are some legal bridges that I think we need to investigate to make sure that they, they are on solid ground. And, and certainly one of the ways to look at this is through jurisdiction and understanding public international law and where jurisdiction comes from, because all of these rules that we're creating are a manifestation of our, our understanding of sovereignty, right? This is the expression of sovereignty. That's what's going on at Copuis. They have the authority to do this. And then they write these rules with particular jurisdictions in mind. And so being cognizant of the international scope of, of space law research, uh, but not taking it on so big as like it's unmanageable is, is always going to be the trick. But, you know, we, we feel that we can aggregate this data and, and get interns involved to be able to have a further comprehensive understanding of sort of the map and the story of space law. And it always starts with the primary rules and it starts with the people who put them together. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, uh, Chris G or Matt, um, any suggestions for how to make better use of, of these archives and collections? Got anything, Chris? Feel free, I'll follow up. Okay, well, again, I, I'm, I'm gonna defer to the experts on archives since I'm, that's not my, uh, our, our strong suit. Um, again, I, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation earlier on, uh, librarians love to create research guides and there's just a gob of research guides. That's an official term, gob. Lots of research guides out there uh, that you know librarians from all kinds of institutions have put together. You know, if you go to the NASA website library, I found you know this summer I was trying to hunt down some documents from them and they had some lovely uh, research guides. I, I've created research guides I, and pretty much any of the libraries that have major collections in these areas are going to have uh, guides and finding aids uh, like Chris mentioned earlier for some of their archives finding aids to put these uh, resources to use. So. Um, yeah, I think that's right. We, we, we do love a research guide, don't we? And they're out there and don't get used as much as they should, I think. And they're easy to find. You know what you do? You Google space law libguide. L-I-B-G-U-I-D-E. You're going to find a bunch. Um, I wanted to quickly echo what you said and Mr. Hedlund said about um, sort of the digitization situation. Um, I think the nice thing about archives is um, that we really don't have many copyright problems usually. So we can freely digitize. And that's what really does hold us back, I think, on more widely digitizing, um, you know, sort of earlier scholarship. Um, but I think it's really important for the reason Mr. Hersey was saying, for example, um, the Haley collection has a huge folder on, um, and does just at Galloway as well, on their conversation with all kinds of people about the issues that they were most concerned with. So, for example, um, you know, delimitation of space, outer space versus airspace. And only in these archives, which we can digitize 
at request, um, if people want to um, sort of dig in and find more about this, um, we can do that freely and share that. So we do do a lot of digitizing when a scholar says, I'm interested in this or that or the other. Sometimes, though, you have to be on site because we can't do the research for you. But I really do think it's one of those things where if you ask us and talk to us, we're glad to explore what we have and give you some sort of description. And when I think the real value um, of archives like the collection we have now is now that I was digging into it more for this presentation, I'm all more excited. I want to go write some stuff. Um, <laughs> it, it's really an opportunity to get a foothold in something that nobody else has written about because nobody's ever had access to these materials or seen these mm -hmm. materials. Um, so I think there are a lot of really, really like Eileen Galloway. There needs to be much more written about Eileen Galloway. Um, by the way, um, she split her papers and the other half are at the Smithsonian Museum of Air and Space Law. And they have a very nice website too. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to the Space Court Foundation. I'm looking forward to the work they're going to do because I do think it's going to be wonderful um, to coordinate. And I would just also say that Everybody needs to be thinking about preservation, like Mr. Hedman says. We may not have these great folders of correspondence that we have access to from the earliest generation. This will be a period of time where we might not have anything if we don't start looking harder to save those materials that were born digital. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris and, and Matt. Um, we're going a little bit over um, time, but we did have a couple of questions from our attendees. Um, yeah. I saw you indicated you'd like to answer this question uh, about space yeah, I, internships. I, I pressed the button there. I don't know what, what happened. But anyway, yes, I, I was asked going to, to uh, respond to those two questions on internship and those um, uh, visiting scholars. Before doing that, j just to offer one detail for you. Um, so the Office for Outer Space Affairs, every year we update the status, the ratification status of the treaties. So this is a task mandated by the legal subcommittee. And it's, it's actually quite a difficult task because we have to go to each of the depository powers. I mean, you can't only go to one and, and, and try to find information there because you have to go to the UK, the US, and the Russian government uh, to check because states, when they ratify the treaties or accede to the treaties, they, they, they can choose which country they wish to deposit them and also the Secretary General for the Registration Convention and the Moon Agreement. So we do that and we update it for the legal subcommittee. So we issue on our website an updated status of all the, the, the space treaties. And, and it's a lot of efforts going down to there. And I think this is the only source where you can find a consolidated, uh, updated status of, of the treaties on an annual basis. I just wanted to, to tell you that. Now, uh, I see here Amanda and Jacob are asking two questions. So very shortly to Amanda, uh, well, uh, I have to discourage you. The internship in UNUSA, uh, we really depend on interns, but it's not paid. So uh, it's unpaid, unfortunately. We have no right to, uh, to pay uh, students to come uh, and do internship. But uh, so there are scholarships and other sources that have to be be, be sought, but internship is an opportunity for young scholars and PhD students to uh, to stay with the Office for Outer Space Affairs for a maximum of six months, you know. And the best period to do internship is actually in the spring, where we have the sessions of our intergovernmental body. So ranging from February to June, that is the prime of the year when you have access to delegations, when you really can can, can get a grasp of, of uh, the space community. So I encourage uh, students to really uh, uh, apply for internship with the office uh, during the, the, the spring period, basically. Now to Jacob, yes, we have had in the past a few instances, absolutely, uh, with scholars that have asked to come to the office to do research, to, uh, to go through the cabinets, to uh, do uh, some, you know, to look into the, the archives we have. <laughs> Sorry, it is not easy. It's really not easy because there is a lot of rules in 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 the in the UN, as you can imagine. Sorry, I got <coughs> okay. Excuse me. Anyway, it's not easy at all. It's uh, it's a huge bureaucracy, and there are several constraints, liabilities, uh, 
all of those issues that have to be sorted out. So it, it, it is not easy at all to, uh, to get access to our archives, if I put it that way. One way is, of course, uh, as a student, we, we allow students to attend the sessions. So when we are in session, STC, LSE and Copus, we also open up for students, not too many, but students coming if they can afford to come from the US is more difficult than from European university obviously, but if they can come to, uh, to Vienna during the sessions, they will be given a badge and they can actually uh, come to the office and they can do some, some at least limited research in our archives during that, those periods. Well, thank you. I heard very someone much. saying something in the background or? Uh, that would uh, be my young ones asking if I was ah. done with my work call yet. Okay. <laughs> Um, which is a great time to try to wrap this up. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, but before we go, we've had multiple questions about either being able to reach out to do research through your libraries or to reach out uh, directly to you um, as well. So um, uh, I just wanted to go around. Uh, Matt, how can people contact the Nebraska Law Library? So if you're going to start for doing some space law research, contacting me directly is probably the best bet. So mnovac3 at unl.edu. So um, that would be your best, best shot there. But we do, uh, I, I guess all librarians love to use lawref as their email. So we also have lawref at unl.edu as well. So uh, that would contact all of us. Excellent. Uh, Chris, I see that you have responded in the uh, chat to people who have asked, but if you could just briefly um, repeat your suggestion. Yes, Christine. please, please, we'd love to help you with it. Um, I'd really like to see, as uh, Mr. Hersey was saying, there's so much great stuff. We'd love to help people use it. We'd love to see people really digging in. And you can email me directly at G I W -L, L I L A N without the D. My last name has a D on the end, but G I W -L, L I L A N at Ole Miss, O L E M I W -S, S, one word, dot edu. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, how can people contact your office? Yeah, I mean, to send an email to me, you will not get a response. What you do, you go to the website and uh, we have a, a central email uh, address there where, where you can uh, put your question and it will be distributed within the office. That's the best. Finally, Chris H, how can people contact the Space Corp Foundation, whether they're interested in an internship program or partnering with us in some other way? Yeah, they can go to our website at spacecorpfoundation.org. Uh, and also on the email, uh, there is the application for the internship. And I believe uh, we use info at spacecourtfoundation.org if you want to send an email and inquire more. We also accept messages on Twitter and Facebook. So uh, feel free to send us some messages there. We do have a social media manager, Sean Case, uh, and a lot of other officers uh, and, and folks that are part of the, the institution. And so I want to give a shout out to all of them and thank you for, for helping us get this uh, this foundation off the ground. So, and with that, uh, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it was really a great panel and I'm glad that uh, we did this. This is fun. Yes, we'll have to do it again sometime. Uh, not the pandemic part, but everything else. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today uh, to our panelists, to our attendees, and to the University of Nebraska College of Law for this Nebraska Space Law Week. Thank you. Thank you, bye.